between the words that are spoken and the words that are heard, may the Holy Spirit be present. Amen. Good morning, church. This sermon has a title, and the title of it is Speaking of the Future. And it is organized around a single text, one line of the readings you just heard. These few words from the epistle of James, the tongue is a fire, the tongue is a fire. A week ago today, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, the home of Thomas Jefferson and of one of the three greatest contributions Jefferson made to the history of the United States, the University of Virginia. I was there because some years ago, I made a promise to a, to a man who was then much younger that if the day ever came, I would officiate as his wedding. And wouldn't you just know, sometimes those debts get called in. And the wedding was going to be in Charlottesville, and so there I was wandering around the streets of a Virginia city on a Sunday morning. It happens that my best friend during seminary days pastors a church in Charlottesville, and so I had a chance to visit with him and wander around the city, and as I did, what I noted was what seemed to be a little brick church on the corner of First and Market Street, right downtown. And of course, being in my line of work, I wanted to know what kind of a church it was, and so I wandered over and drew in to have a closer look. It turned out not to be a church, but rather a place called The Haven. At first I thought that was one of those euphemistic names that emergent churches give to their communities to sort of help you think they're not really a church. But it turned out to be a shelter and a kitchen for homeless people, a place that they can come in out of the elements and get a place to rest and a meal to eat and a place to wash. A graduate of the University of Virginia, a fellow named Tom Shadyak came back to Charlottesville a while ago to, direct, ago to direct a movie, and while shooting location shots around the city, he noticed a great many homeless people on the streets, far more than he had seen 25 years earlier when he'd been a student. And then he noticed that the old First Christian Church on the corner of First and Market Streets was closed and for sale. And so he bought it, and he renovated it, and he turned it into a place of radical hospitality for people on the street. They Oops. And now they make money to support the work that they do for homeless people by renting out the space for events. I sat on a bench across the street, and I watched that place for a while. I saw volunteers coming and going and greeting each other with great joy seeing old friends for the first time in a while, bringing in supplies for that day's offerings. I saw people in need coming in and being fed and, ser fed and served. And folks, I bet you know what I'm gonna say next. But I'll say it anyway. If that church had had the vision to do those things, it would be open today. So what happened? What did they lack? They had the building, they had the roof, at least at one point they had the congregation, they had the same homeless people in the streets of the same city needing help, they had the same sources of support on, the same neighbors in Charlottesville who gave of their money and their time to help these neighbors in need. They lacked only one thing. They lacked a voice, just one single voice that could speak into their midst the possibility of what they might do. And because of that, they closed, and others took up their work. 
for the lack of that voice where there might have been a church doing the work of discipleship, now there is a church-shaped building in which others are carrying out the work. The author of the letter of James understands the power of a voice. There's first the power of the voice of a teacher, not necessarily a loud voice. The wisest voices, voices are often the hardest ones to hear. But a voice that can shape our thoughts, shape our ways of thinking, shape our understanding of the world, that is a teacher's voice, and that is a profound responsibility. And anyone who is a teacher and takes that vocation seriously should always rise in the morning with humility about their work. But beyond that, the writer of James sees that the tongue is more powerful than any other part of our bodies. Because that part of it sets loose on the world ideas. It makes our reputation among other people because of the things we say and the things we fail to say. With our tongues, we can sing God's praises. With our tongues, we can harm others profoundly by unkind words and, and thoughtless statements. With our tongues, we can lead people to build up the kingdom of God and to serve others. And with our tongues, we can tempt others to hate and ruin and degradation. The tongue is a fire. It can either light new possibilities in the world or burn down our own house. And it is with the tongue that we give voice to our answer, the question that Jesus asks us this morning. Who do you say that I am? What, what do you say? How do you use your tongue? to answer that question. Do you know the form that question takes in our world today? Do you know it when you hear it? It takes this form. Why do you go to church? When you answer that question, the fire of your tongue can light you down in honor or dishonor. When that question, what gets laid bare, is whether you are a joyful follower willing to share what you have gained or whether instead you are ashamed to be associated with Christ and his ideas. Brothers and sisters, I am saying all of this to make you acutely aware that this morning we bring five new voices into, into our conversation five new tongues to set alight visions for what our church might be and what it might become. Bettina has known us for a while. She has been listening to our voices. She has grown up in other traditions and she has been drawn to our community by the evidence we give it is to serve the needy in Christ's name and after Christ's example. She has thought about this deeply. And having thought about it, she has things to say back to us about ourselves that we might not yet know. Brooklyn, Connor, and Sean they are the youngest voices that we will add to our conversation today. They did not grow up here. And we do not know how long we will have the gift of their voices among us. But they are here now. And here is where they have chosen to raise their voices for the first time in speaking their own faith on their own. And here, friends, is the great blessing that we receive 
in adding their voices. They have not yet learned, as we think we know, what is impossible. In their voices, if we listen, we will hear the sound of the future God is calling us into because they see possibilities in us that we long ago gave up on. So listen to them. You may need to listen hard, especially to Brooklyn, <laughs> because like all wise people, she speaks very softly. You may need to get closer to them to hear, but their voices speak hopes that chart the path to the church we are supposed to be. And in them, we can hear things we thought we could not do. Now, there's one more voice to be added to our conversation today. A voice that we will hear again today for the first time. It is a voice that has, until today, spoken up in vestry meetings, it is a voice you may have heard preach here from time to time or to read a lesson. It is the voice of our brother Robert Vukovic. And today, in the sound of that same voice, you will hear Robert declare his intention and desire to be a priest in the Episcopal Church. The conversation between Robert and our church has involved many, involved many voices over many years. He has spoken to some of you about his past and the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church and his journey of faith to this place. The voices of the vestry and of Chris have spoken to me in support of receiving Robert as a priest among us. Even the voice of the presiding bishop has been spoken in all of this, speaking his approval of our hope to receive Robert among us as a priest. And now all of that is over. And only one voice really remains to be heard. Because we did not make Robert a priest, and by faith we know that the Catholic Church did not make Robert a priest, God made Robert a priest. God endowed him with a set of gifts to serve the church in sacramental ministry. sacramental ministry. God gave that man a heart of compassion to love all people after the example of Christ. And God gave him a voice to preach the gospel to anyone who will listen. So this morning, after all of those voices and after Robert's long and patient waiting, it is time for the church processes and rules out of the way and to make space to hear one voice, the only voice that matters, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because that voice speaks now through Robert and Brooklyn and Connor and Sean and Bettina and makes all of them and all of us the voice that God has set a light with the fire of love to speak in the world. And so, Lord, make us masters of ourselves, that we might be the, we might be the servants of others. Take our hands and work through them. Take our minds and speak through them. Take our tongues and preach with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. <laughs>